But the problem with being a TOF is that it's very rare. And so it's a new disease as well, because until surgery was up to curing TOFs, they all died. So it's a new disease since the 1950s or so. And uh, I'm based in Hull, and one of my predecessors, a cardiothoracic surgeon called Kevin McGeesey, was one of the ones, one of the surgeons who pioneered TOFs operations. And so there was a, a large, relatively large for a rare disease, number of people in Hull who had had an operation done by Kevin. Uh, so they started to present to my clinic. And my great interest in life is cough, the cough reflex, right? And so I started to be called the prof of tough cough. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've learned a lot from patients with a chronic cough who don't have toughs, right? So that understanding of how the coughing and the throat irritation and all of these sensations that people get are generated has been really my life's work. And okay, toughs are unique in the cause of their respiratory problems and other problems, but <coughs> the fundamental reason is the same as the patient with a chronic cough, which is a very common disease, of, particularly of middle-aged ladies. So we've got some wonderful new drugs being developed, um, and we've got some drugs, old drugs, which do work. But the doctors out there, the nurses, A, don't understand the disease, and B, don't understand that there are treatments available. So that's me. How about you? Anybody got any problems with that? Someone mentioned Barrett's esophagus, or a couple of people mentioned Barrett's esophagus. It's a waste of time, Barrett's esophagus. Yeah. The gastroenterologist. What Gap Barrett's is, is the lining of the stomach, the cells lining the stomach, are different from the cells lining the esophagus. And what happens if you've got reflux is that the cells come up into the esophagus, they grow into the esophagus, and that's called Barrett's. It's supposed to be a pre-malignant condition, so they'll be wanting you to have an endoscopy every year or so. Every three years. Every three years, yeah, okay. Well, the, the risk of having, you having a, a, a cancer from that, that is extremely small. I mean, being a chest doctor, uh, you might as well screen everybody with cigarettes, uh, who have uh, had cigarettes to uh, see whether they got lung cancer. And indeed, that's what they're doing. <laughs> but they do these CT scans, and uh, only 4% of them actually turn out with these lumps that people get in the chest, turn out to be cancer. So all of this screening is probably uh, over-egging the, uh, the custard. But the patient with the TOF, the doctors think that once they've joined it up, so someone mentioned they had a colonic uh, transposition. So you take the colon out with its blood supply and stick it in the gap, all right? But the colon is very different from the esophagus. The colon only goes one way, right? Whereas the esophagus is a very clever organ, right? Very under-researched, but it's an extremely clever organ in that it does things both ways. So it's not only swallowing, but it's also getting rid of the wind. So it's a, an organ which has motor power going upwards and downwards. So I'm very fortunate in Hull because we've got an extremely uh, good laboratory here who do esophageal studies. And the esophageal studies reveal that patients with TOF, there's often a gap in that movement. So a patient with a colonic transposition, there'll be very little movement of the gullet. And so it's mainly gravity that is pushing the food down into the esophagus, down through the uh, colonic trans uh, transposition or through the esophagus. And it's not just about muscles. It's not about just about muscles pushing it down. 
the, the nervous system which supplies the esophagus and makes the movements either upwards or downwards is an extremely complex thing. But simply put, well, let's go back and just talk about the relationship of the esophagus and the lungs of the trachea. Right? Whoever designed this bit of the body was an idiot. <laughs> right? Who would put the windpipe and the food pipe next to each other? Mistakes are bound to happen. Right? <coughs> it's even worse because we are prone to reflux as human beings. Right? In all animals, the esophagus runs along the backbone, goes through the diaphragm, and then the stomach hangs vertically. Right? So there's a right angle. Whereas in us, it goes straight down, and then the stomach's underneath. Right? So we don't have this right angle protecting us. And indeed, what happens is that the diaphragm pulls the esophagus backwards into your back. Right? So you're trying to recapitulate that right angle. Right? But it doesn't work very well. Okay? So we're prone to reflux because of our bipedalism. And then, when it comes up here, we've got a valve here that prevents it going down the wrong way. Okay? That's great. In all animals, there is the soft palate, the retinoid cartilage, and uh, epiglottis, which forms a valve. But we human beings do something completely unique. We talk. So if you look at the baby, it's got that soft palate, <coughs> uh, epiglottis, uh, retinoid cartilage there. But in us, the soft adults, the soft palate has migrated up. Right? So we have an incompetent valve here because you need that space here to make the words. And it's much more important evolutionary for us to be able to make the words. And the risk is, of course, that you will then aspirate. So aspiration is stuff coming, going down the wrong way, basically, in, into, your, uh, into your lungs. When we've got a situation like that, there is also a problem with the sensation that you get. So all of this bit from here downwards to, the, to there is controlled by a nerve called the vagus nerve. Right? The vagus <coughs> nerve wanders around the body, innervating the heart, the lungs, the esophagus, <coughs> and then the rest of the guts. And what we found out about patients with cough is that the vagus nerve becomes hypersensitive. So patients often will find that they are set off by things from outside, like strong smells, bleaches, perfumes, deodorants, that sort of thing. And that's because the nerve endings are super sensitive. I explained it to my cough patients by saying, it's like having a burn on the skin. You blow on it, and it hurts. The same is happening in the throat. What's the origin of this hypersensitivity? Well, that nerve, the vagus nerve, runs through into the gut along the esophagus. And so if you've got esophageal atresia, that nerve is likely to be damaged. Right? And when the surgeons go in and put a lump of coal on in between, sure enough, it's going to dam uh, be damaged as well. So the fact that the nerve is damaged or never there in the first place, is an indication that the esophageal motility, the movement of the esophagus, will be poor, and that lack of movement. So when we do a test, we, we give them 10 uh, sips of water and 10 bits of bread to swallow. Right? And most people have one of those fail, one, one of those 10 fail. right? But we have people, some toffs, who have absolutely no movement at all. They've been able to survive because it's gravity putting it through, right? But the doctor doesn't realize that actually the origin of this coughing and all the rest of it is because of the esophagus. And the esophagus, when it's irritated by the, the liquid or solid that sticks in the esophagus, then irritates the nerve. Because the nerve lies right up against the esophagus. Hmm? The, vagus the, the vagus nerve, yeah. Right, and we can. There's a beautiful experiment done by uh, my friend Peter from New York. There is a branch of the vagus that goes into your ear. 
right? It's called the nerve of Arnold. So this nerve doesn't go anywhere near your lungs or your esophagus or anything like that. Huh? And people have known for many years that when you instrument the ear, some people cough. Right? It's called Arnold's reflex. Right? And that's the vagus nerve. It's something to do with the gills of fish being part of the ear nowadays. Right? Uh, so that nerve gets, irritated, gets uh, stimulated when you put something like you know, cotton bud in the ear. And so my friend Peter took 200 patients with, uh, sorry, it was 300 patients, 300 patients with chronic cough and looked at their arms reflux. Over 20% of them coughed, right? Whereas if you looked at uh, normal people, it was only 2%. So it's showing that the vagus nerve is hypersensitive even when it goes nowhere near the place which is causing the irritation. So patients with a TOF will have symptoms because of this hypersensitivity of the vagus nerve, but the cause of it is rising from the esophagus. And people do not understand that. So what sort of symptoms do people get? <clears throat> well, my voice just went there, and that was probably a bit of reflux because I've just had a cup of tea. Right? So they get voice change. Right? Uh, this irritation, you know, if you go along and see an ENT surgeon, they'll say, oh, well, we'll send you along to the speech and language therapist, and they talk about vocal cord dysfunction and all kinds of weird diseases that are made up. Right? But in fact, it's caused by the irritation of the vagus nerve and stuff landing on it. So stuff will come back and land on the, uh, on the larynx. Some of it gets through the larynx into the lungs, and then you get a bronchitis caused by it. If it's quite a lot of stuff going in, the breathing tubes get damaged, and then you can get a condition called bronchiectasis, where the, where the airways are thickened and enlarged. And then that produces quite a lot of phlegm. So qu quite a few TOFs that I look after have this bronchiectasis. Right? But it's not always happening. It's quite rare, in fact. But I just happen to have a couple of uh, real <coughs> crackers in my clinic uh, who have this bronchiectasis. So what else? Swallowing difficulties, right? But that's not very frequently commented on, even though we can demonstrate that the swallowing is buggered in the test. Right? So there is a tendency for esophageal spasm. That's where you get pain in the chest. Right? And Caroline and I were having a chat earlier on, and she's saying that she's got uh, quite bad esophageal spasm at the moment. And the doctor wants you to go to the cardiac uh, unit to uh, check out whether you're having a heart attack. <laughs> but it's the same pain, you see. So the same pain of esophageal spasm, which is the ischemic pain, the lack of blood supply going in because the, the esophagus is tightened up like that, right? that feels exactly the same as the pain in the heart attack. I get it. The first time I got it, I was in Sheffield and I was arguing with one, uh, a professor, uh, another professor, and I've got this horrible chest pain. Right? Well, you bugger, you give me a heart attack. <laughs> but it keeps on happening, so it can't be a heart attack, can it? Right? But <laughs> Well, a lot of people are misdiagnosed with angina, particularly people who have this esophageal spasm. They get misdiagnosed with angina and they're put on a shed load of <coughs> cardiac medicines, when in fact there is no evidence of any heart problem. It's because the same nerve supplies the esophagus and the heart that you get the same sort of pain. Pain in the center of the chest, deep and really quite nasty sometimes. And I've actually been crying with it some, on occasions. And then it can go down the left arm just like a heart attack. Well, the GP said to me, why do you think it's soft your spasm? And I was like, well, because the pain's in my esophagus. And it's it, like, it's kind of hard to explain that when you've got top, you kind of know where your esophagus is and what it feels like, whereas the average person won't know necessarily what esophageal pain is. Well, you can differentiate it fairly easily because the pain occurs at rest. Mm. You know, so you'll get it watching the television or lying in bed. Whereas cardiac pain is probably induced by exercise. That's the commonest thing, or cold air. So it's fairly easy to differentiate clinically, but the doctor doesn't understand. 
because they have ignored the esophagus. The man who looked at the nerves in the lung and the esophagus was a guy called John Widdicombe. And John Widdicombe, uh, he and I were friends for a number of years. He sadly passed away uh, about 10 years ago. But John looked at the nervous system of the lung and the esophagus, right? Uh, and he said that the esophagus was the most under-researched organ in the body. And it's true. It's true. And therefore, there's a whole lot of people out there, in fact, most of the medical pro profession, are completely ignorant of this. And I'm sure a lot of you will have had experience of going along and saying, the doctor saying, oh, I don't understand what's going on. You know? Well, it's quite fairly easily explained, a lot of the symptoms. So does anybody else get the, this hypersensitivity? Yeah. Tell, tell me your experience. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I was just saying, I was talking with Caroline earlier as well, um, and the esophageal spasm, much as you described it, if I hadn't had medical knowledge, I would have said, I'm having a cardiac arrest. Yeah. Um, as I said to Caroline, I checked my uh, wonderful um, Apple Watch, which told me I wasn't having an arrhythmia, although my heart rate had increased. Um, and then I was thinking it must be something to do with this, my esophagus. So anyway, I actually just sat there and massaged. <laughs> Sounds, and, it, and it eventually it eased, but you're absolutely right. The, the amount of concern, um, and, and coming back to what you said about doctors often misdiagnosing, um, that can happen with us. I think everybody in the room will understand that being referred to EMT or being referred to respiratory physio because, you know, you've got pneumonia, you've got asthma. Um, okay, let's, let's do asthma, shall we, then? <laughs> I don't know what asthma is. <laughs> <laughs> right. We've got it, though. No, you haven't. haven't I know. You haven't, but they're all diagnosed as it because you present to the doctor with cough and uh, wheezing, right? And you're a non-smoker. So it can't be COPD, which is the other, there's two diagnoses of chest disease, COPD and <laughs> asthma, right? So it has to be asthma. What else could it be? Well, they don't realize that you get a bronchitis from uh, having aspiration. So it's a complete mystery to them. <coughs> the problem is that there is a disease of asthma, which I call asthma, I call it kiddies asthma. So this occurs when you're four or five, you get allergic to house dust mites, pollen grains, that sort of thing, right? It's an allergy, right? And an allergy calls in the allergic cells, the eosinophils, and that produces this spasm of the breathing tubes, giving you the wheeze, and it also increases the uh, tendency to cough. So there is a disease that all doctors have been trained about, which is this asthma. Right? But in fact, only a proportion of the bronchitis that you get is due to this type of allergy inflammation. Right? And the inhaled uh, drugs, the steroids, work brilliantly in this. Right? So in my career, I've gone from lots of people t trucking up to uh, A&E with an asthma attack, a proper asthma attack. Right? And we put them on the inhalers, and now we hardly ever see anybody who has proper asthma coming into the emergency department because the drugs are so good. So this has got into everybody's mind that all of the chest diseases are like that. Whereas, in fact, the TOFs bronchitis is completely different, and because it doesn't involve the allergic cells. These are called eosinophils. So if a doctor tries and diagnoses you as asthma, you say, well, what's my bloody eosinophil count? It's just a simple blood test, full blood count. Right? And if your bloody eosinophils are raised, some people with TOFs, they get an allergic type reaction. It's not an allergy. And they do have this thing that's like asthma. Right? I call it eosinophilic bronchitis because it's the allergic cells and it causes the bronchitis. But that's really quite rare, more, much more common is a reaction which is like ordinary bronchitis and that doesn't respond to steroids 
So I've seen people come into my clinic and they've been given steroid course after steroid course and steroid course, and their bones are all brittle and, you know, it's because the doctor doesn't have the idea that they can get a bronchitis from the esophagus not working properly. So I, I, I don't know, has anybody done the, the breath test on it? I was treated for with um, inhalers for years. Um, diagnosed with asthma. Yes, of course. So, Kate, did, they, did the inhalers work, though? No. no. Like so why didn't the doctor stop them? Involved <laughs> courses of oral steroids, yeah. recurrent chest infections. And They're not chest infections. I met you a number of years ago, I have to say, and you're my hero, because <laughs> my husband is somewhere, and he would tell you the same, that I can now walk long distances, and I can walk uphill, and they have a lot more energy, and I'm coming towards my 70th year, and I, I'm a lot fitter than I was when I met you. And that's because I started a PPI, and that I hardly use anything. Okay, let's talk about PPIs for a second. So PPIs were the treatment for reflux, but they don't treat reflux. Right? All they do is block the acids. So if you're having a lot of acid reflux, then PPIs are very good. Okay. Sorry, proton pump inhibitors. Lanzoprazole and omeprazole are the two commonest ones used in the UK. So they are brilliant at the acid symptoms. Doctors call them peptic symptoms, right? So if you've got heartburn, that is a really, uh, you know, it should respond to a PPI, and, you know, they are very, very commonly prescribed. But they don't treat the reflux. What you're getting when you've got a, a, a knackered esophagus, as I call it, <laughs> is that you get reflux, but it's not acid. So what comes up is a gas or a mist, like a belch, but you don't notice it, and then it goes in through your larynx, hits the larynx, makes your voice go funny, lands in your lungs, gives you a bronchitis. Right? And it's not an allergic-type bronchitis, so the inhaled steroids and the oral steroids don't work. Right? So you're a good example of a PPI responder, but that's quite rare. I use other drugs to treat the reflux of uh, um, TOFs and the people with chronic cough who have esophageal dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So and I was doing a conference yesterday for the junior doctors in my society, British Thrash Society. And I, I asked them some questions. It was all one of these internet things, you know. It's, uh, I hate them, but anyway. So I asked 111 of them how, whether these uh, uh, drugs are working on the reflux, and almost everyone said yes. But they don't work on the reflux. They work on the acid. So if you want to work on the reflux, there is a very commonly used drug called azithromycin. Right? Azithromycin is an antibiotic and it was marketed as an antibiotic, and it's a damn good antibiotic, right? But its main side effect is GI upset, gastric upset, all right? And that's because it actually works on the hormone that drives the esophagus working, motilin, and it works like motilin to make the esophagus work better, right? It's not a miracle cure in everybody, but it is the recommended treatment for this disease bronchiectasis. It works in exacerbations of COPD, it works in chronic cough, and it works in cystic fibrosis, for example. So all of these diseases are characterized by poor movement of the gullet. Right? But the doctors, see, the, that was the British Thoracic Society, so all they'd look at is lungs, right? But their name says anything in the thorax, right? So I challenged them how many organs are in the thorax, right? And some said two, but the answer is three. There is the heart, the lungs, and the esophagus, and they're all supplied by the vagus nerve. So when you had on um, your uh, uh, heart attack and your pulse was racing, that's because the vagus nerve was stimulating your uh, heart. So my ex-wife has this esophageal problem as well, not uh, uh, tough, but, uh, and she gets palpitations when she gets an attack of reflux, because the same nerve supplies these different organs. So going back <coughs> to the experiment that my friend Peter did, 
it's a hypersensitivity of all of the lung, so you will uh, all of the uh, organs, so you will get hypersensitivity of the larynx. Does anybody suffer from voice problems? Come on, let's have a volunteer at the back there. So sometimes when I've had very good <coughs> flux, um, my voice becomes really, really strained. Like, I've got a sore throat, but I haven't. Yeah. So I don't know what, yeah. And uh, have they suggested anything to help with that? No. <laughs> so throat clearing is a very common symptom as well. Do you clear your throat a lot? Yeah. 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 And how, how, do you, how do you know it's reflux? I'm just assuming it is. <laughs> well done. Well, in answer to Caroline's point uh, earlier on, when the doctor says, ooh, I want to check out the heart, I, I would recommend you say, I've already got one disease. Why do I need two? <laughs> well, I had an echo a couple months ago. So I'm pretty sure it's fine. <laughs> well, echoes are I hardly ever go to an echo. Well, that's because they thought I had a heart murmur, which I also thought was chest. When I had a bad chest infection, which I also thought was chest sounds or a mishearing, but yeah. I thought I'd better play, um, play the game and go along with it. Yeah, you have to humour them. Yeah, you exactly. To, you'll go to a doctor and you'll know more about your disease than the doctor does. Right? But you have to humour them. You know, they're very proud people, a lot of these <laughs> chaps. And uh, they, uh, they dismiss you because it's just a cough or it's just a bit of chest infection. So when you aspirate a, a, a considerable amount, then it lands in the lungs and it goes to the bottom of the lungs because of gravity, and so you get a little patch on the chest x-ray, right? And then you'll go along, be sent along to A&E, they'll do a chest x-ray, and there you are. It's pneumonia, right? But it's a special type of pneumonia. It's not a bacterial pneumonia. It's not like your average pneumonia. It is aspiration pneumonia. So it lands in the, uh, in the lungs and there is the shadow. But it's caused by aspiration and not an infection. So you'll be given antibiotics because of the pneumonia, but it isn't a bacterial pneumonia. Millions of people are given these antibiotics for no apparent reason. And it's tragedy, really. We're all trying to reduce the amount of antibiotics prescribed, and yet the immediate response from the doctor is, it's a chest infection, query pneumonia, take antibiotics. But it's not bacteria that's causing it, it's your stomach contents going up and landing in your lung. Anybody here been diagnosed with chest infections? Yeah? Yeah. Tell them it's not an infection. This is curious at the moment because, uh, as far as I'm aware, I had a very partial collapse on my lungs from presumably the reinflammation or whatever that didn't quite work out. Uh, I've had a chest infection which I went to the doctors for. I was given an amoxicillin, which wiped out some things but didn't quite clear the infection up. I had more amoxicillin, had no effect on the on the on the phlegm I was bringing up. It's still fairly green, whatever. And I've given up on that now, so I'm sort of still there. But the, the point was that the X-ray showed the the little collapse or whatever. And the doctor suddenly found himself pinpointing, oh, look, there's this nasty thing that's, or not nasty, but yeah. this thing that they found there. And I, said, I did point out that I believe I've got a partial collapse lung at that particular point. And that was it, end of, so there was no more. Yeah, I mean, it's the failure to recognise that the chest infection is not an infection at all. Yeah. It's an aspiration, right? And you can do things, so I, went, I was going on about this drug, azithromycin. I mean, that is exactly the sort of, because uh, it's an antibiotic, right? Yeah, so you can say, I'll take this antibiotic, but I want azithromycin, because I know it also works on my other problem, which is my gullet. There's another thing with the uh, metromycin. I, I, when, I when I went into the doctors only recently to find out what was wrong with me, she said that she would not prescribe that until the endoscopy had taken place. The endoscopy is down barren or whatever else. So she's excluded. Why, why, would, why would she prescribe it? I have no idea at all. <laughs> I mean, it's extraordinarily safe. <coughs> at one time, it was the commonly prescribed pill in the United States. Yeah. Right? Millions upon millions of patients have taken azithromycin. And okay, it does cause. Azithromycin. 
right? And so azithromycin, you know, it, it, it's miraculous in some patients. I've had one lady on it for 25 years, right? And she got her cough back when she had COVID, right? And so I, 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 she came and saw me and I said, well, how is that azithromycin? She said, it's a miracle. I, I never miss a dose. It's fantastic. It has transformed my life for the last 20 odd years. That's because she had esophageal dysmetility and she has the spasm as well, you know. But the azithromycin has sorted her out. But for the, for the acute infection, which was an infection, COVID, right, I've given her a bit of morphine. So a bit of morphine can reduce that cough quite a lot in some people. It doesn't work in everybody. But in some people, if you're having a really bad... What? What should be laxing? No, no, it works centrally on the cough reflex. So I mentioned that the, you were hypersensitive on the vagus, right? Okay, so the nerves are very sensitive, but also this nerve goes into the brain, right? And so it's the central part of the proje uh, projections of the vagus, which actually, I mean, we all co can cough <coughs> like that, right? So that volition will cough. Right? But when you've got hypersensitive uh, brain as well as a hypersensitive nerve, then you cough even more. And what morphine does is replace the natural inhibitory processes in the brain to dampen down the cough reflex. Right? But it only works in about half the people. Sorry, yeah, um, I've got a very sensitive vagus nerve. I mean, I, I know one occasion we were sat on a plane and I had to move. <laughs> Luckily, I was with my husband because the guy next to me had really strong aftershave on and I was just yeah. choking all the taste. What can be done for that? Is the right. Well, the hypersensitivity is, see, the, the ends of the nerves have receptors on them, all right? And so cold air is a very common precipitant as well. If you go out on a cold day and you start coughing as you get out the door, all right? And on the end of those nerves are actually temperature receptors, right? So when you get the cold air, it lands on that temperature receptor. It's called a trip A1, okay? uh, uh, but the trip A1 is quite a promiscuous receptor. It'll bind to quite a lot of things, right? And one of them are the smelly bits in perfume, right? The smelly bits in perfume are usually eugenol and bergamot, right? They are, they're the aromatics that you can smell, all right? And they also bind on the end of the nerve as well. And so they can set the nerve off. So it's binding to these receptors, but their receptors are on a hypersensitive nerve. So normal amounts, which you and I wouldn't cough to, the patient with this type of hypersensitivity will cough to these normally innocuous stimuli, right? What can we do about it? Well, there are a whole raft of drugs coming through. So what actually makes the nerve hypersensitive? And we don't really understand the mechanism for this, but when the, the lining cells, the epithelium of the airways, larynx, wherever, get damaged, they send out signals. They're called alarmins, right? Alarmins tell the other cells that they've been damaged in some way, right? And one of those alarmins is a thing called ATP. ATP is the energy packet to the cell. And that lands on the nerve and sets it off. Drugs have been developed which block the ATP binding onto those nerves. Right? And in the gephopixent, which is the first drug of the class, that has um, been shown in large, very large, 2,000 patients, clinical trials, that it reduces that sensitivity. They've had a difficulty getting a license because of an argument about the cough counter they used in the trials, but it is licensed in Japan, so I've got some over from Japan, and I can give it to my patients. Uh, but nobody else in the world does. So, uh, well, you'll join a very long waiting list. It goes outside the door and around the block. <laughs> but it will get a license eventually. Um, the real question for people in the UK is that, will it pass NICE, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, right? So the makers, Merck, 
are looking at the American market because that's where they'll make all their money. Mind you, they invested over a billion pounds in this drug, billion pounds. And one of its rivals, which is slightly less uh, forward in its development, has just been bought by uh, um, GSK for two billion dollars. Right? So there is a serious amount of money going into this to develop these drugs, which will relieve that uh, uh, hypersensitivity in the lungs and the throat, and hopefully in the esophagus too. So there's an enormous uh, hope that this will come through. But I, I despair sometimes with the licensing or the, sort of the uh, permission that you get from NICE to prescribe. So I will be prescribing it privately for a private prescription. I'll see the patient on the NHS, but I have to issue a private prescription because it won't have approval from NICE, uh, I don't think. And certainly the drug companies, we, they, they won't make enough money in the UK to pursue it, whereas they want to make the money or have to make the money in, uh, in the United States. But Do you think if it gets a license, it will be like the fancy drugs like the biologics and the DNA social centres? Uh, well, it's a difficult one because the biologics are extremely difficult to make and very complicated uh, drugs. Uh, and the problem <laughs> with the biologics, these are drugs which tackle the asthma component of airways disease. Right? These biologics uh, have, uh, in the NICE guidance, you have to have a, a diagnosis of asthma. But as we've explained, <laughs> Most patients, most top patients, don't have asthma, right? So you fall in between, you've got the disease, but it's called the wrong disease. And I have great difficulty persuading my colleagues that this, we, we'll call it asthma. So I deliberately call your condition asthma in order to get these drugs. Um, but that's quite a rare thing, uh, Caroline. This gefepixent and its, uh, and its uh, cousins will be entirely suitable for a lot of the respiratory symptoms that the top patients get. But if you want to stop the cause of it, then you need drugs which work on the esophagus, and that is azithromycin. Or if you've got an intact bowel at the top of your stomach, so you've only just got a, a, a relatively small top, then because when you've got a large uh, uh, gap, they pull the stomach up, don't they? Right? And so the valve is now right up here, whereas normally it's held here and it's closed by the diaphragm. So a lot of people will get coughing when they laugh or when they're uh, shouting at someone or particularly people talking on the telephone. And that's because the diaphragm holds that valve closed. And then when you're making the words, you open the valve <coughs> and up comes this mist. Okay? And it's a complete mystery to most people. Why do they cough when they're, uh, they're talking? Shouting and laughing is the thing. And it's also positional, of course. When you lie down flat, you're putting the valve under a bit more stretch. And then you start <coughs> coughing when you're lying down. Interestingly enough, when you go to sleep, there's an increased tone, as it's called, in the vagus. Right? They, and it slows the heart down. So when you're asleep, your heartbeat is slower. And it also slows down the movement of the esophagus. So you don't have any reflux, or very few people get reflux at night. Then when you wake up, you're usually all right. It's when you get out of bed, come upright, all of a sudden you get this tickle and start coughing. And that's because the valve has been told to open to allow the gas that's been entrapped in the stomach to be expelled. So up it comes, lands on those sensitive nerve ends and causes the coughing. Question over there. Um, so I have tracheomalacia, which wasn't like re-diagnosed from being a child, because obviously it's presumed you sort of grow out of it um, until I was 14. And it wasn't after until me arguing with the doctors that it, the inhalers didn't work. So does the azithromycin, because I'm on that, does that directly help with the tracheomalacia, or is it sort of indirectly alongside PPIs? If that makes well, sense. No, no, uh, do you have heartburn? Pardon? Do you have heartburn? 
Sometimes. Yeah. 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 No, 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 I, no problem. I've heard a lot worse, don't worry. <laughs> so, the PPIs will work on the heartburn, but it won't work on the coughing or on the pneumonia or aspiration, right? The azithromycin will work on the movement of the gullet and therefore prevent the aspiration, the stuff going into the lungs and landing on your voice box. So they're two separate mechanisms of action. They don't work together. Um, and often patients come to me in my cough clinic on PPIs because the doctors nowadays realize that a lot of the coughing is due to reflux. And they put them on PPIs, but PPIs block acid. They don't stop the reflux. Right? So they've given them the wrong treatment. So I usually stop the PPI. <laughs> right? Because PPIs have lots of side effects, they cause osteoporosis, for example. It's not harmless. A lot of people get tummy upsets from them, and you know, but it's dished out like nobody's business. They're thought of being as safe, but in fact, they're not safe at all. So the reason why we have acid in our stomach is to kill the bugs. So we, when we eat food, we'll eat bugs, and the acid's there to kill them, right? So if you block the acid, do you know what happens? You get an increased incidence of infections. Carry on, yeah, go on. Um, I'm also being sent to a cardiologist. It's a reg regularly go tachycardic, so right. as you mentioned, and um, <laughs> I get reflux and nausea with this as well. I've got other yeah. comorbidities that feed into things as well, but um, how would I bring that up that it might not be cardiac to other medical professionals, sort of, not and that it could be from the TOF, not that, if that makes sense. Well, uh, it depends on your cardiologist, right? Um, I had a friend, and I used to describe him as arrogant, even for a cardiologist. <laughs> <laughs> they do tend to really know what they're talking about. You, know, you can't contradict them. Um, but I, I presume that you don't have... Uh, you just have a fast heart rate. There is no abnormality there. Is that right? Not on my community team, but I just yeah. go to tachycardia. I sometimes do have a cough outside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're just like Alan then. What? Hello? Tachy <laughs> tachycardia caused by the oh, esophagus. It's so the esophagus. Well, it's it rub it there. <laughs> well, Alan's describing a, a procedure here where you rub here, and that's where the blood pressure measuring organ is the carotid sinus, right? And you press on it, and you can stop a fast heart rate by doing that. Right? You mean the ears? Yeah, a lot of ear problems, though, are caused by the reflux going up into the ear because there's a tube called the eustachian tube goes from the ear down into the throat. That's what you do when you're in an aircraft and your ears start popping. If you go like that or swallow, then the ears will pop, right? And that's because the eustachian tube conduct, conducts up to the ears. But there's a disease where they put in grommets in children, right? Uh, glue ear, it's called, right? And when they... Uh, did the operation to put the grommets, little uh, valves, into the eardrum. Uh, they aspirated it. This is in Newcastle. They took out the fluid and they measured it for pepsin, the stomach enzyme. Half the kids had pepsin in their ear. Right? So this stuff gets everywhere. The ENT people call it laryngopharyngeal reflux, or even more stupidly, silent reflux. It's rather stupid calling it silent reflux when it causes a cough. You know? <laughs> but I call it airway reflux. Right? And if you want to see whether you've got it, I've got a questionnaire called the HARC questionnaire, Hull Airways Reflux Questionnaire. And it's 14 questions, and you score yourself out of five for all of the 14 questions. So we ask you, you know, 
do, do you have cough in the morning uh, when you get out of bed? Uh, do you cough when you're talking? Right? And you can score yourself. And most patients with TOF will score above the upper limit of norm, which is 14 out of 70. Right? And that, you can take along to the doctor and say, look, this questionnaire, well-validated questionnaire, says that I've got airway reflux as the cause of my illness. Right? Now, it might work or it might not. You know? But I'm, I'm very happy to, if you're having difficulty with a doctor understanding, just tell them to drop me a line. But there's a thing called advice and guidance. Right? Yeah, and I'll be, you know, I get two or three of these a week where the doctor will write saying, I don't understand X, Y, or Z, or do you think this drug will work or this one? And all you do, I uh, just send out a little uh, note saying... Well, if you've got a good cardiologist, they will recognise the relationship between the esophageal reflux and the heart. Right? Yeah. Sorry, the... Did you? I was just going to say that there was a lady on the forum that claimed she didn't have reflux but had Barrett's that scored 57 on the on park. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, but my question's going back to the, um, to do with you saying about asking pneumonia, because I had finally got an infection, was picked up by sound, then by x ray, and then it's meant this is the usual of being given antibiotics. The x-ray showed that they hadn't improved. I've now had to have a CT scan. And it's like, I'm going around in circles. So, and I keep saying, like, why can you contact Professor Morris? And it's like, it really does fall on their fears. I've got quite a few patients from Glasgow. <laughs> so, they, you know, the That's not, great. Not, not, not all Glasgow doctors will uh, uh, tell you to go away. But... They've been trained to look for pneumonia, which is infection. And when you look, there is a pneumonia, but it's not infection. So they assume that it's a common or garden pneumonia, when in fact it's due to the aspiration. And they do a CT scan because you might well have damaged your breathing tubes. But that's not the cause of the coughing. It's the result of the aspiration. So if I did a CT scan on all of you toffs, almost certainly some of you will have thickened breathing tubes. Right? or even dilated breathing tubes, this disease, bronchiectasis. And typically it produces green phlegm. Right? And often that is... You know, I'd, I'd love to give you some steroids and see where the green phlegm went away, you see? <laughs> That's what I would do. That's Only a week. question, which is going to ask, that, that on many times I've had antibiotics, we haven't worked. Yeah. And then once I've had that, we could bring this alone. And now, in negotiation with the GP, it's mostly, don't have antibiotics. Right, well, you probably have this eosinophilic bronchitis because the inhalers don't work very well in this eosinophilic bronchitis as opposed to ordinary asthma. So in ordinary asthma, the inhalers are brilliant. You know, if you don't respond to the inhalers, you probably haven't got asthma. Right? But people do have this eosinophilic bronchitis, which are the same cells, but they're in different parts of the lung. They're deeper in the lung, so the inhaler, which only lands on the surface of the uh, breathing tubes, doesn't get in. Right? And steroid tablets work. How quickly do they work? A couple of days. That's what I said. <laughs> two days. Yeah. Right. Yeah, two pulls in the antibiotics. Yeah. You know, week or ten days, and you go back, and they're still not working. Yeah. Week, and let's put some right, so you can, you can go back and tell him you've got eosinophilic bronchitis. Okay. Yeah. So Monte Lucast is quite a good drug when you've got that. <coughs> That's an anti-asthma drug, but it, since it's a tablet, it doesn't have the problems of the inhalers only landing in the uh, in the airways. What was that drug, sorry? Monte Lucast. Sorry, I don't really like the sound of my voice on this, but I'll, I'll try. So I've had Monte Lucast in the past, but it, it gave me um, very imaginative dreams. Oh yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> so. nightmares are perhaps yeah. the commonest uh, <laughs> side effect. It was a bit, um, I had, uh, I travelled um, in the Far East when I was younger and I had um, 
anti-malarials, and it was a very similar experience. Oh, that's uh, that bad combination. Yeah, though. so I think my imagination it has enough help already. So, <laughs> um, so um, the reason that one of the reasons I've come along today, and I don't know how common this is, so I had a gastric pull-up for a yeah. long gap. It would have been 1978, or when I was um, not quite six months old. And then pretty much no follow-up care after that until adulthood. Well, you were cured. <laughs> I was, I was <laughs> fixed. <laughs> and then, um, I, I don't mind saying this, I felt silly at the time, but in my 30s, having going back and back, because I was having what was called repeat chest infections that just would not clear, um, then they said, okay, eventually uh, an X-ray, and then they put me on a lung cancer pathway, which I said, I don't have this. Um, completely the opposite of everything that, you know, could be that. So uh, my husband, my, my brand new husband at the time was rather worried. I wasn't worried. So I was like, this is ridiculous. I don't know why we're on this pathway, but we're getting seen. So that's good. Um, and then I got a, a chap, a spiritual chap at um, Bradford Royal Infirmary. Um, and he uh, said, oh, you know, you've got this uh, complications up here. Have you, have you had a gastric pull up? And I said, well, I, I was just always told my tummy was higher. That's, that's all I was ever told as a child. Um, so that sort of discovered that, but then they also found that my, my, um, oh, it's, um, I've lost the word, the diaphragm, diaphragm yeah. had, had broken again in, in my adulthood, yeah. uh, possibly when I was horse riding and, um, I got thrown off a horse and it opened and some other things have gone up to my chest. So my pancreas is up there, um, some gastrointestinal tubing. So generally I've got quite a lot of overcrowding. And my last ch scan was 15 years ago, so I'm 45 now. And I've, I'm waiting on a consultant's appointment and I'm dreading the conversation when I say to him, I am very confident something else is up there now because I've felt movement. And I, I think some of you all feel the same. I feel really attuned to, to my chest and my back. I have pain every day. Uh, I have a lot of uh, sensation in my back, it's very acute. And I've never heard of the vagus nerve, and now I know exactly what, what that is that's causing that symptom. So that's fantastic today. And I'm waiting for this consultant's appointment with a respiratory consultant, and I'm dreading sitting in front of him saying, I think I have more things up in my chest. I can barely walk a short distance. My quality of life is going down. And I just need someone to understand it. Well, I don't think having more stuff in your chest is the main problem here. It's the fact that you're having recurrent aspiration. Yeah. And who is it in Bradford, do you see? Uh, well, it changes every time I get a different letter <laughs> moving the appointment. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure yet. Is it Airedale Hospital in, in Yorkshire? Well, so. they'll, they'll know me. Okay, so yeah, if I give you a name. we're all in the yeah. Yorkshire Thoracic Society, you see? Fantastic. So just say... So name drop. <laughs> uh, just say Alan says it should be uh, uh, azithromycin to start yeah. off with. Well, because I m mentioned the TOFs now if I speak to anyone, but my GP just says we don't know anyone else with this, so they don't know where to go with it. I will say steroids have helped in the past with a bit well, of you a... Boost. Take them along the TOFs book. It's a really good book. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. There it is. It's a real yeah. thing. Bring it over. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else got any uh, queries? Just had a quick bit. Um, is there any benefit to taking PPI on a as required basis? That's what I do. Yeah. So it t the reason why they don't recommend it as an as required thing is because it takes about two hours to work, right? So you don't get instant relief with the PPI. What happens with the PPI is it actually has to go through the stomach and into the small bowel before it's absorbed. Right? And then when it's absorbed, it goes back into the stomach via the bloodstream and stops the acid. So it's got a long path to go before it actually is effective. So they recommend other things like uh, Gaviscon or whatever. Um, Gaviscon is very good for heartburn because heartburn is liquid acid. But Gaviscon forms a raft which prevents the liquid coming back up, but it doesn't do anything to the gas. Right? So although it works on heartburn, it doesn't work on the reflux causing the cough or the aspiration. So frequently people will get a PPI and Gaviscon and then come and see me and I'll stop both of them. It sucks to ask 
right time still. Yeah, quite literally, it's awful stuff, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Domperidone, there are two drugs, metoclopramide and lomperidone. Metoclopramide, they're all um, work on the esophagus and the stomach. And they both were commonly used, and still are commonly used, for the relief of nausea and vomiting. They're really quite effective. But particularly metoclopramide, and to a lesser extent domperidone, work on the valve. So if you've ha got, still got a valve, that will tighten up the valve and it stops. See, the valve isn't open uh, or closed. What happens is, every so often, the stomach or the nerve tells the valve to open. So when you get out of bed, for example, the nerve tells the valve to open to allow the gas that's uh, been trapped to come up. And there are various other things uh, that uh, set it off. So domperidone, I prefer in people who've got neurological problems because it doesn't get into the brain, blood-brain barrier. The reason why doctors are rather reluctant, particularly some GPs, are rather reluctant. In fact, I was doing a letter yesterday on, on exactly this issue. The GP didn't want to prescribe the metoclopramide that had worked for a patient because there was a warning about giving it long term. Mm. And this was issued because in France and other countries in Europe, there was uh, over-prescription of this to higher dose. And people get funny movements. So whenever I prescribe don, um, uh, metoclopramide and domperidone, particularly metoclopramide, I always tell the patient, watch out for funny movements. So I've seen it three times in my entire career. Right? So it does occur, but it's very rare, and yet the GPs have been frightened by this warning from the regulator, the MHRA, saying don't prescribe it long term. And I've had to go through all of the committees in our local area to say, yes, it's all right for me to prescribe for people with reflux. So domperidone and uh, metoclopramide. But the trick with all of these drugs is I can't look at you and say which one's going to work. We don't know enough about it to be able to pick the patient for the drug. So what we do is we do therapeutic trials. We'll take one drug, try it for a month. Doesn't work, try the next one. Doesn't work, try the next one. Do you get a, do you get a long term build up with them? So Felicity's been on domperidone for 15 years yeah. now. Um, does, so it work? does it Does the body stop? Does well, it stop working? Does it work? Working? First question. Pardon? Does it work? Does it work, Fleck? You domperidone? Yes and no. Well, it can't be yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon? If she's not on it, if she doesn't take it, she knows. Okay, so it does work. Yeah, it does work. Yeah, okay. Well, that's working on the valve at the uh, top of the stomach and improving the esophageal motility. And it's a drug I use a lot. It's pretty safe. You shouldn't give it to people with bad hearts, though. So don't tell the cardiologist to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm quite safe to keep taking metoclopramide, aren't I? Because my GP stopped me last year. Yeah, exactly what I was just I, talking about. I had three months of not very well. Yeah. And I was also post-COVID COVID yeah. when I wasn't eating. And anyway, then they rang up again, the pharmacist from the surgery, and said, how was it? And I said, blooming awful. And the next thing I get to... A call from the GP to go back on metoclopramide, and, and I've been fine since. There we are. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's the problem that I face, is that the GP wants to uh, stop it because of this warning. Yes. Whereas, in fact, I tell the patient, if you start break dancing down the road, you know it's the tablets. <laughs> all right? <laughs> so all you do is stop it, and it goes away. The problem comes if you keep taking it. So the worst case I've seen was a lady in a nursing home and she came along and it was, it's dancing movements really. So the, the, the dancing analogy there is more correct than the shakes or whatever. So she was rhyming away and <coughs> the GP had continued to be prescribing the metoclopramide despite her developing this uh, uh, dancing movements. And because she was in a nursing home, the nurses were giving it to her, right? So the patient had no control over it, and neither did the relatives. And so it became a permanent thing. Uh, 
think it was something neurological? Well, believe it or not, doctors are extremely ignorant about drugs. Right? So one in ten of the referrals to my cough clinic are on a drug called an ACE inhibitor. Right? That's, uh, the commonest one is Ramipril. Right? And it's good at lowering blood pressure and it's good for the heart. Right? But its commonest side effect, one in ten people get a cough because it increases the sensitivity of the cough reflex. And yet, one in ten of the patients I see are on Ramipril. You know, I go, can't they read the label? A, the patient, but B, the doctor should know. You know, it's a waste of a couple of hundred quid of his uh, money sending me a referral for that. It's, uh, it's tragic. My husband was very ill a few years ago with um, a particular illness, and he was prescribed Stemtil. And no one made the connection. And five days later of intense Parkinsonian yeah. symptoms, they still didn't make the connection. And they kept telling me that there was something really seriously wrong with him. He had typhoid. But they, that they also thought that he had some other neurological damage. And it wasn't until we referred to Liverpool to the infectious disease. And the specialist said, that's stemital. That's what's, that's why. Yeah. And he was shaking and he couldn't swallow and was very debilitated did he by get, stemital. Did he go like that? No. Well, that's the more severe form. It's no. called an oculogyric no, crisis. It can be really impressive yeah. that the person's like this no, with it. it, didn't, but it, it, it I think it's just what I'm trying to say is that he, he was under a cardiologist, a respiratory, infection control, all, the whole team at the hospital, and they didn't. We, we went home and I took him off the medication and, yeah. Yeah. Well, read the, read, read the leaflet. Yeah. Uh, they should have read the leaflet. Yeah. yeah. No, Stematil does do that. Just confirming that what you're saying. Yeah. Unfortunately, we trust these people, but they don't always, yeah. they, don't always read, they don't always read the leaflets. Well, I, I have a different perspective. My training is in clinical pharmacology, the study of drugs, right? So I'm only a chest doctor by, you know, second, uh, second, um, uh, intention, but uh, you know the ignorance of the side effects of drugs, and then the overemphasis on if they get a bad name. So, as I said, I prescribe quite a lot of morphine, and I'm just reading this mo at this moment uh, 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 about the uh, opioid epidemic in the United States, caused by the Sackler family, right? And it's an absolutely disgusting tale of greed poisoning people with these drugs, right? But that has carried over into Americans' doctors saying, well, you shouldn't give morphine at all. Whereas with cough, if you give a low dose of morphine and it works, it works. But if you give them morphine and it doesn't work, it's not working. There's no point in going up to the massive doses of this oxycodone drug that the Americans were using. And that's why, you know, they had hundreds of people die every day from morphine, uh, uh, um, oxycodone was the drug, oxycodone overdoses, right? And it was all because of this family of uh, sacklers greedily wanting the profits from their drugs. So it's got a bad name, morphine, particularly in the United States, and I cannot persuade them that this low dose of morphine uh, works and without, virtually without side effects, a bit of constipation perhaps. The way I explain it to the patients is I'm going to give you five milligrams, all right? And if you, I'm treating pain, I use 50 milligrams. And if you're a junkie, you take 150 milligrams. Right? So that's the difference. But trying to persuade them because of this, the drug has a bad name. It's, uh, you know, misconceptions with regard to the drugs and their side effects. Sorry. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, it's re with regards to my daughter, um, she says she's a bit tired of taking meds. Yeah. Um, and because she's going to transition soon from children's to adult um, clinic, yeah. so um, the consultant said they were going to do an endoscopy, and if there was no evidence of reflux, um, they might stop all the meds altogether. So um, my concern is um, reflux, they say, can be silent. Sometimes you don't know until it's caused some damage and all that. Is this a wise thing to do, even no. if they do this endoscopy and there's no, no. evidence of reflux? No, waste of time. Endoscopy doesn't really show you the poor movement, right? What shows you the poor movement is a, a test called high-resolution esophageal manometry, right? 
and this is a tube down and as I said before you swallow 10 bits of water and 10 bits of bread. High resolution yeah. esophageal should be able to spell that manometry. 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 All right, so it measures the pressure waves going down the esophagus, right? The problem is I have a very biased view because Hull has the best unit in the country for doing this, right? And we will often get referrals from uh, around the country. I had a referral from a TOF uh, from on the Wales border. And they'd done this test, high resolution esophageal manometry, and reported it as normal. When I looked at it, there was virtually none. No movement. So the people reporting the test didn't understand their own test, and that's very common. Right? I, you know, perhaps 50% of the reports that we get from this test are wrong, from sent elsewhere. And so I have a, uh, we have a, what's called an MDT, multidisciplinary team. So there's me, <coughs> there's the esophageal physiologist, <coughs> Warren, and then there's the surgeon, Pete, right? And we sit there for uh, an hour or two, have a bit of a laugh and a joke and a cup of tea, right? And we can, you know, it's pitiable that these reports are coming out saying so-and-so is normal. And it's usually because they've got no acid, right? So they look at it and say, oh, no acid, no reflux. But acid reflux is only a small part of it. So the endoscopy will look for damage caused by the acid. Right? But I suspect the main problem would be non-acid reflux, and that's why you need to do this test if you're doing a test. The real question is, are there any symptoms? Right? If there's no symptoms of heartburn, don't give the PPI. If they're... Um, and you know, they'll be wanting to check for Barrett's, yeah? But as I say, the yield from Barrett's is extremely small in terms of surveillance for... Uh, I think they do it just to keep themselves busy. <laughs> Sorry, did that answer your question? Um, yeah. So she's, is she on a PPI at the moment? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, well, I would try stopping, you know, and see what it's like. If she gets lots of heartburn, go back on the Lanzoprazole. Right? Yeah. But it's the reflex in their head. They think <coughs> reflux, they think blocking the acid. Whereas, in fact, in TOFs, it is mainly non-acid reflux which is causing the problem. So. Hi. Um, so I've, I've had manometry done in London, and that shows I've got practically no motility myself. Also got Barrett's. <laughs> Um, and I have PPI, but I managed in my GP practice, like you say, as if I have asthma. Yeah. So I have inhalers, I have a flu jab every year, and I have what they term as a annual asthma review. Um, what else could it be? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> do you, would you say it's probably worth going back and discussing with them? Should I try this? Uh, the other medication instead? Yeah, yeah, I would certainly try azithromycin, yeah. Uh, but the question of whether it's asthma or not, what I look at is these allergic cells. So you can either look at the blood count and look to see whether the eosinophil count, the allergic cell, is high. <laughs> and if it is, you've got the same as this lady here who's got eosinophil bronchitis. Right? Or uh, they don't respond so well to st uh, inhalers, uh medicine. Have you ever had a prednisolone course? Steroid uh, course? Probably in the past. I mean, the, the last time I had something that was anything like a chest infection, I just got on with it. <laughs> yeah. I just let it run the course. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you know, you've aspirated and it'll be cleared by the, uh, the body. The, the white cells go out and eat all the stuff that you've been mm -hmm. inhaled, right? So the idea that every bit of shadow on the chest x-ray needs antibiotics is, you know, bad teaching the doctors. Uh, so I would look for the, get them to look at the past blood counts, and if you've got no eosinophils above normal, mm -hmm. forget about it, the inhalers, that is. Uh, but there is also a, a breath test, which perhaps they've done on you, where you yeah. blow, and it's the nitric oxide, FENO it's called, 
And if that's elevated, that's another indication that you've got eosinophilic bronchitis. And they're not all the, both tests, the bloody eosinophil counts and the uh, in exhaled nitric oxide, that points the doctor towards the diagnosis of eosinophilic bronchitis. But I routinely would say, we'll do a little experiment. I'll give you the prednisolone for five days. And if, like you, you get better in two days, we know the diagnosis. So it's a, an experiment that you do. But otherwise, if you don't respond to the steroids, it ain't asthma in my view, no matter what your doctor calls it. Right? And I chuck the inhalers away. <laughs> you can take a blue inhaler, though, uh, when you get a spasm. They're quite good at relieving the spasm, and they work quite quickly. Right? Yeah, I've got, got both of them, yeah. like the steroid and, and the blue one. Yeah, but the blue one does work when you've got... Suppose you've inhaled something, Right? and you get uh, wheezy and tight with it, the blue inhaler should work on that because it works on the smooth muscle to open the tubes up. But they're mistakenly thinking you've got asthmatic inflammation if, if you're not in the eosinophilic bronchitis group. So there's four of you to every one of you. <laughs> right? So you're in the, perhaps, if you're, ha if you're not a steroid responder, you'll be in the common group of people who have this bronchitis. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to ask. I've not heard of the um, manometry test before, but I've had the like a barium swallowed a couple of times over the year. Does it work in a similar way? Um, and how do you rate that as far as uh, testing for? Now you've had a, a colonic transposition. Is no. that right? No. 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 Sorry, someone over there did. Yeah. So, so what? What? What op, op did you have? Um, I had the short gap. Oh, wait off. All right. So. That probably won't show very much in the esophageal uh, study, I'm um, um, sorry, the uh, barium swallow. It's quite poor at showing the poor <coughs> movement, right? It's quite good for looking at lesions. So if you've got a, a colonic uh, transposition, it's a horrific picture, you know, because the colon outlines, and often it'll dilate. So one of my lads has an enormous dilation colon in his chest. Right? Because over the years, it gradually stretches, right? and it becomes a large pool. And when he has an aspiration event, which he does occasionally, it's really quite dramatic, because a lot of this big pool of stuff ends up in his lungs. Uh, but for you, I wouldn't have suggested that uh, a barium would be the right thing mm -hmm. to do. But if they do do a high-resolution esophageal manometry on you, you know, and you're not happy with the <laughs> result. I'm very happy to have them sent over, and we can discuss them in our MDT. And I, all I do is write a little letter back to the GP saying, well, the, the report was wrong. It shows a lack of gullet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because that, that, that was my experience with the barium swallow as well, being stood in the, you know, I'm still on the tilt table or whatever it is, and everyone's sort of looking at the, the video of it going, um, no, no one really having any clue what they were looking at, so that was also not very reassuring. Well, I, you know, <laughs> I have a very close relationship with our uh, radiologist, Nula, who does the uh, barium swallows, right? And so she and I will stare at the screens quite a lot, right? But you need someone who's really quite expert in doing that to be able to interpret what you yeah. see. Right? It's the movement that's the problem, mm -hmm. right? And that doesn't show up on a plain x-ray, even with barium. Not being biased at all, being an ex-nurse, but any advice for us people who frequent doctor's offices uh, in challenging when we know it's our esophagus that's playing up? When it, it's, what is your advice as a doctor in, in bringing that to the forefront? A, a lot of people find conversing with someone who doesn't know anything about the disease you're talking about. And this is true of chronic cough, but a whole range of diseases. People will come to me and say, you know, they fobbed me off with this or fobbed me off with that. And it is a difficult thing because you challenge them, challenging them professionally by saying, actually, I know a lot more about this disease than you do, doctor. 
you know, my suggestion of taking the Toff book along would, I think, work in some people. Right? It all depends on the doctor you have. There are others who, you know, oh, that's interesting. I've never heard of this disease. And Google it and be very interested in it. Right? That's what I do anyway when I come across, I came across someone on Thursday who had a disease I'd never even heard of, which is bloody rare. <laughs> and it sounded like he had it as well. Uh, but anyway, uh, so if you're interested in medicine and you've got a good doctor who is interested in medicine, they'll like you, right? Whereas if you've got someone who just wants you out of the door, right, then you're in a sticky wicket. But the book says to the doctor it's a real thing, right? And there are all of the experts in that book telling the doctor about it. So it's not some fantasy you've picked up from the internet. I mean, I think it's an excellent book, Caroline, you produced that. It's no good asking them to Google you, uh, on, uh, Google it on the internet. You know, they, as we know, the internet's all um, full of unreliable advice, whereas a, a book from the uh, association, that is firm evidence for the, they can deny it, but it's there. I think we'd, we'd all agree we just want to clone you <laughs> and have you in every surgery for all of us. Well, as I say, if you, if you really hit a uh, brick wall, tell the doctor to write to him. You've all, you've all got, the, you've got my address, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah email, right? So... Let everyone hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Professor Maurice, thank you so much. That was really informative. Thank you. <laughs>